Hello everyone and welcome to EduSearch Clinics. We continue our discussion on inflammatory bowel disease and today we are going to start with the second pillar of diagnosis that is imaging and laboratory investigation and relevant differentials. So just to recap, we have seen the phases of IBD and the natural history of disease. We are on phase one that is detection and diagnosis of disease. We have extensively studied the first pillar of IBD diagnosis that is clinical features. You have seen this in the previous video. We have seen these differentials based on clinical history and we have had a lot of discussion on how to differentiate the features based on history and examination. We have seen the key clinical pulse okay, or the key points that you need to ask in history and examination. So now we will go into the second pillar that is the laboratory investigations and imaging. When we come to laboratory investigations, the most important feature in IBD that is different from other diseases is fecal calprotectin. Okay, what is calprotectin? It is a cytosolic protein content in neutrophils. Okay, remember this series has been designed so that your entire IBD topic and relevant diseases are clear for exam as well as for life in clinical practice. So a lot of multiple choice questions and things are answered in this series, okay? So calprotectin is a cytosolic protein contained in neutrophils. It is released into stool when neutrophils are activated in the wall of the intestine, okay? Interpretation of the report, if the levels are less than 50 to 100 micrograms per gram of stool, the report is likely normal and IBS may be a differential. 100 to 250 is a gray zone. Okay, Inflammation is likely and any of the differentials can be possible. However, if the level is more than 250 microgram per gram of stool, the patient likely has inflammatory bowel disease or if the patient was already diagnosed, this is a relapse or a flare before clinical symptoms if on follow-up, okay? So this is the interpretation of fecal calprotectin. Understand that contamination of the sample with urine or tissue can affect the results and calprotectin is not specific for IBD. It can be high also in infective colitis and colorectal cancer. So these are important points. However, if we get a true report with proper collection of sample, then it can help in distinguishing between IBS and IBD. Okay. So that is an important stool test. Some other important points in stool test, you know, fecal local blood test. If local blood is positive, we have seen which of the conditions can have blood in stools. Other test is fecal lactoferrin, which is not routinely done, but if done, it is elevated in IBD and suggests active inflammation. Many infections can be identified from stool test. Okay, bacterial infections such as C. difficile toxin, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and enterohemorrhagic E. coli. All these bacterial infections can be identified in stool test. Parasites like Endomyba histolytica, GLDL, Lamblia, and Cryptosporidium can be identified. And viral infections such as cytomegalovirus, you can do a PCR in stool sample. So all these different conditions can be diagnosed based on a stool test and thus helps in differentials for IBD. Going to blood parameters, we know anemia is not seen in irritable bowel syndrome. So that is a differentiating feature. Elevated leukocyte counts common in infection or inflammation. Elevated ESR lymphocytosis can be seen in TB or can be non-specific. Interferon gamma release assay is also done for TB. You can do IBD serology, but this is not routinely done as it has low sensitivity and specificity. For multiple choice questions or if it is done, ASCA is common in Crohn's disease and PNK is common in ulcerative colitis. You can see that specificity is good for both the tests, but sensitivity is quite low. Okay. Understand that 
panka is common in ulcerative colitis and eska is common in Crohn's disease, commonly as questions. You can do blood culture and serology for anti-salmonella antibodies. Peripheral eosinophilia may be suggestive of eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Elevated lactate acidosis and leukocytosis, if you have all these features, that is common in bowel ischemia and kangri. Some of the important thrombophilic states such as protein C, protein S, factor V leaden, lupus anticoagulant, all these can be done in blood. So all these are important blood tests. CEA, as we know, if it's very high, suggestive of colorectal cancer. However, again, not very specific and more than 10% may be non-secretor. So that is something that needs to be kept in mind. So all these important blood investigations and differentials will also help you once you have gone through the clinical history. Advice tests based on your differential diagnosis based on history. So we have seen stool and blood. Now we go to imaging. In imaging, x-rays are not very useful for primary diagnosis. However, x-ray can help in complicated IBD. Patient can have perforation, which will be seen as free air under diaphragm. Toxic megacolon, the diameter of transverse colon more than 6 cm. Extra intestinal manifestations, spondyloarthropathy can be seen on x-rays. Chest x-ray can be done to rule out tuberculosis before starting infliximab or to rule out immunosuppression induced pneumonia. Fluoroscopic imaging for small bowel, we do barium meal follow through or barium androclysis. And for large bowel, we do barium enema. So this is on the basic imaging, fluoroscopy and x-rays. Coming to small bowel fluoroscopy in ulcerative colitis, you can have incompetent IC valve with nodular ileitis. Whereas in Crohn's disease, you can have stenotic ileocecal junction with luminal narrowing and ileal ulcerations. Fat wrapping will be seen on fluoroscopy as bowel loop angulation and kinky. Okay, so that is important. Cobblestone appearance is due to transverse and longitudinal ulcerations and strictures. In terms of fluoroscopy, it is an invasive procedure and not definitive. Patient can be intolerant to oral contrast and there is rapid distension in enterocolysis which can cause pain. No extra luminal information is obtained. If there is inadequate bowel distension which is common in small bowel follow through, the findings may be missed. Also, with current imaging advances, fluoroscopy and expertise in interpretation of fluoroscopy is limited. So, there is limited availability and limited experience in interpretation. So, all these are limitations of fluoroscopy. Coming to barium enema, one of the indications is high clinical suspicion of ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis, as we know, the pattern is of continuous involvement and rectum is involved early. You can have afters ulceration. Lead pipe pattern, which is one that is seen due to loss of hostrations, is very common in ulcerative colitis. So, lead pipe pattern, ulcerative colitis, cobblestoning, Crohn's disease, C for C. If you don't want to understand and remember, if you just want to memorize, cobblestoning is seen in Crohn's disease. Like we saw, P. anca, pipe, lead pipe and P. anca common in ulcerative colitis. Lead pipe occurs due to loss of prostrations. The widening of prespectral space, more than 20 mm, is also a feature of ulcerative colitis. On the other hand, Crohn's disease has skip pattern. Rectum is spared or involved late. So, these are the differentiating features on imaging. Cobblestone pattern already discussed. So, that is how you can differentiate ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Now, when we compare fluoroscopy or barium enema with colonoscopy, we can see that barium enema is non-invasive. It just needs an enema catheter. It is indirect and subjective evaluation. Like I said, limited availability and limited experience in interpretation are major limitations of fluoroscopy in current era. Okay, Colonoscopy, you are putting a camera inside. It is a direct and objective mucosal evaluation. 
doubtful reproducibility in varia minima whereas colonoscopy definitely is reproducible screening modality is varia minima diagnostic modality colonoscopy varia minima of course will have less complications and less costly because perforation is not possible colonoscopy perforation rate is 1 in 5000 advantage of colonoscopy is that biopsy can be done simultaneously but it is expensive okay so if you want to decide which test to do, these are the points that you need to consider, okay? But in today's world, the fluoroscopy is used less commonly. More commonly, what we use is a CT scan because ultrasound has no major role in these conditions. So, CT scan is preferred over fluoroscopy because it is rapid and we get those NPR images, multiplanar reformation, and we also get a lot of extraluminal information, right? CT enterocolysis is equal to barium enterocolysis and it requires a nasojejunal tube placement. So, we don't do CT enterocolysis commonly except an accepted indication of CT enterocolysis which is partial obstruction. For all other indications, CT enterography is preferred. Neutral contrast is favored over iodinated contrast before neutral contrast is tasteless, more palatable. Mucosal enhancement is not obscured when you give neutral contrast, whereas in iodinated contrast, you will not be able to see mucosal enhancement. On the other hand, stricture evaluation is better with iodinated contrast. So, this is what you have to remember. Coming to venous, intravenous low osmolar contrast is good for bowel wall enhancement and extra luminal info. However, if you have suspected bowel obstruction or perforation, then we need to give positive oral contrast. Whenever you are advising a CT for IBD or for colonic cases, you need to give a complete prescription. You want contrast enhanced CT, abdomen, pelvis. You want which contrast to be given, oral positive or negative. Are you giving iodinated or low osmolar contrast? So all these points need to be covered. So, when to give positive rectal contrast to study the pattern of disease? Is it skip disease versus continuous disease? To see the submucosal extent, ulceration, lymphadenopathy and presence of fistula. However, for perianal fistulas, now MRI pelvis with or without contrast is the test of choice. But for a CT scan in IBD, all these points need to be understood. And accordingly, a discussion with the radiologist needs to take place so that you get all the information from the CT. Now, MR andrography is coming in the plan of management, but it is not as commonly done as CT. Indications of MR andrography, one is to follow up of the cases to look for disease activity. Because when you have frequent follow-up scans, MR has a benefit that there is no radiation, right? So, in phase 2 and 3, MR is more important than compared to phase 1 as per our natural history of disease. Standard sequences that we look for are non-contrast T1, T2, diffusion and CNA images. So, these are important MR sequences for bowel wall edema. We look at SSFP, that is T2 steady state free precession sequence. Okay, these are all MCQ questions. T1 imaging is for mucosal hypervascularity and comb sign. Okay, so comb sign. Remember that in MR, contrast is T1. Okay, contrast is not T2 because in T2, water is the contrast, right? So water, bile. All water containing fluids like spinal fluid, everyone will look white. Okay. So, T2 image can be seen for edema because edema is water. T1 is contrast. So, you can look at hypervascularity or comb sign. Okay. Dynamic T2 imaging. When it is a dynamic imaging, you can look for peristalsis and stricture. Okay, you can separate peristalsis from stricture because if the stricture opens up, then it was peristalsis. If it remains the same, then it is a stricture in dynamic T2 imaging. You have stir or spare images. If you have heard the terms, stir is short tau inversion recovery and spare is spectral and inversion recovery. These are T2 fat saturated sequences. Okay, and they again can be used for 
bowel wall edema, abscess, and fistula. Again, all these three will have fluid, water, and that is why T2 works better in this. Diffusion weighted imaging, as we know, diffusion weighted is in areas of restricted diffusion, that is inflammation, abscess, cancer. Okay. So that is for diffusion weighted imaging. Again, diffusion is a T2 sequence without contrast. So understand that everything to do with water is T2 sequence. Cine imaging is T2 dynamic. Post contrast, contrast is where you have T1 imaging. Okay, so these are some of the important multiple choice questions as well as MR sequences that you need to be aware of while advising an MR entrography for colonic pathology. So just to summarize, based on what your suspicion is on clinical history and laboratory investigation, you can advise a particular imaging test. Okay, If you are looking at small bowel disease, CT enterography is the first line. Okay, For small bowel disease, CT enterography is the first line imaging investigation. Capsule endoscopy cannot be done if you think that there is an obstruction. Okay, So capsule endoscopy is done only when you feel that there is no evidence of obstruction or when an endoscopy is required. Okay, CT enteroclysis is useful. Like I said, the only indication now is suspicious partial small bowel obstruction. If it is large bowel disease, predominantly imaging is replaced now by colonoscopy. So for diagnosis, first line is colonoscopy. CT is to look for pattern of involvement and for evaluation of extraluminal disease. Because as we said, colonoscopy can't comment on extraluminal disease. So CT and colonoscopy complement each other. When you have a case of acute abdomen, X-ray is to rule out perforation and toxic megacolon. If there is megacolon, then you should not give oral rectal contrast. If there is no megacolon, then you can give oral rectal contrast to look for fistula or abscess. When you are doing a CT, the CT can be continued till urography phase if ureteric stricture of fistula is suspected in cases with hydronephrosis. So your entire planning of scan depends heavily on clinical history and laboratory investigations. And that is why a discussion with radiologist is very important in these cases. So that you advise a test and the radiologist is aware of why you have advised a particular sequence, right? For follow-up, like I said, on treatment, phase two, phase three, MR entrography is good enough because multiple scans are required avoids radiation and contrast. For sacroiliac and hip joint, MR of the involved area works. For biliary system, the preference is MRCP. And for perianal disease, the test of choice is MRI pelvis, especially for abscesses and fistulas. So this is how we select different imaging modalities for different type of involvement of disease and the sequencing of test imaging that is to be done in each of these has been summarized here. So in the next part of this video, we will look at the imaging findings for the differentials of IBD and then we will push in towards the third pillar that is the endoscopy. Thank you.